Good morning. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's free webinar, The Best Pitch Decks, How to Create a Winning Pitch Deck with Mark Phillips from RFR Ventures, Carrie McElroy from Cooley, and Cirque Rowe from Early Growth Financial Services. I am Erica Malsberg, Chief Marketing Officer for Early Growth Financial Services, and I'm going to be the moderator for this webinar today. Um, this presentation is going to run about 40 minutes, which should leave us a lot of time for Q&A, which is a good thing because I'm sure you all have lots of questions for our panel. Um, if you do have questions as we go through the presentation, please feel free to just enter them in the question field. You don't need to raise your hand or any of those things. Just enter them right in, and we will try and enter, uh, answer questions as they come up, um, or we might wait till the end uh, to the Q&A session to answer them. And if we do run out of time, we will try and follow up with everyone through email or in some way get answers to all your questions. You can also tweet us questions um, after this presentation to at earlygrowthfs using the hashtag winning pitch, and we'll respond uh, that way as well. And you'll receive a follow-up email tomorrow, which will contain a link to the slide deck and the recording, so you'll have that as reference. So just to jump in, I want to start by introducing our presenters today. Um, first, we're honored to have Mark Phillips with us. Mark is a managing partner at RFR Ventures, a Silicon Valley-based micro-venture fund focused on technology startups and early-stage companies. He's also the author of a fantastic book called Inside Silicon Valley, How the Deals Get Done. And if you haven't already, please definitely check this out. It offers great insights into the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem and it's just a super helpful resource. Um, we also have with us today Carrie McElroy. Carrie is Senior Vice President of Business Development at Cooley LLP. Carrie manages new business development and assists Cooley clients with growth and financing strategy. Carrie also manages the firm's relationships with accelerators, incubators, angel groups, universities, and other organizations focused on entrepreneurship. Prior to joining Cooley, Carrie was an early executive at a venture-backed startup and practiced as an intellectual property attorney. And last but certainly, certainly not least, um, we have Cirque Rowe. Cirque is the Chief Operating Officer for Early Growth Financial Services. Um, he has 25 years of finance experience with 17 years serving in financial leadership roles with high-tech companies. He's an accomplished finance executive focused on leading early-stage companies through strategic financial decisions. So good morning and welcome, everyone. Um, before we jump in, let's uh, just have a few words about um, Early Growth and Cooley. So, Cirque, um, can you jump in first and, and just say a little bit about Early Growth Financial Services? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Erica. I'm thrilled to be here um, this morning, um, and I'm thrilled to be doing this presentation with, uh, with both Carrie and with Mark. Um, Cooley is a fantastic partner, and, and they really, really know the space of, of early stage um, uh, tech companies. Uh, and, and so it's, it's great to be doing this with Carrie and Mark. Um, you know, we we recommend uh, your book um, to all of our clients, all of our startup clients, when they are um, doing any kind of fundraising. So this is this is absolutely an honor um, to be doing this with you. Early Growth Financial Services. We are a an outsourced accounting and financial services firm. Um, and we provide basically four types of services. We do corporate tax returns. We do 409A valuations or company valuations for, for companies who are providing stock options to their employees. That valuation should be done um, on a minimum on an annual basis. And then we provide consulting services um, at both the transactional level, so the day-to-day, -day, week week-to-week, uh, month-to-month accounting and bookkeeping, as well as CFO level services. And those last two services we provide on an hourly basis. We don't do minimums. We don't do retainers. Um, we, we basically um, go as you go and grow as you grow um, with a client. Um, and so as you can imagine, we work with um, early stage. We say the SMB space um, here in the Bay Area where we started. SMB typically means tech startups, and that's where we've kind of, you know, uh, that's our sweet spot. Um, but we do work with other types of companies. We have offices around the country, um, started here in the Bay Area, uh, in San Francisco and Silicon Valley. We also have offices in Los Angeles, um, Seattle, Washington, um, uh, Boulder, Colorado, Austin, Texas, Chicago, um, and New York. And we have um, a team of uh, 28 CFOs, a team of 65 to 70 accounting professionals, um, and, um, and, and that's it. Great. Thanks so much, Sirk. And Carrie, can you tell us a little about Cooley? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Sirk, Erica, and Mark. I'm very excited to be participating today. Um, so Cooley is one of the nation's leading law firms. Um, we represent innovative companies, uh, not just in their early stages in seed and venture deals, but also in IPOs 
m and a's and beyond and we have sort of the ancillary practice areas that help support you in your early stages that includes employment tax privacy litigation so the whole firm is designed to grow with your company as your company grows um, we were formed uh, in the 1920s in Silicon Valley so we have deep roots um, on the West Coast, and we have offices um, throughout the country and in London and Shanghai. Um, we formed the first venture fund in the 1950s, so again, we've been working with uh, venture capital funds and innovators since then. Great. Thanks so much, Carrie. Um, so on that note, let's, uh, let's go ahead. I'm going to hand it over to you, Mark, um, so you can jump right in and maybe say a few words first about who you are and are for adventures, and then we'll really dig in and get going. Thanks, Erica. Thank you, everyone. Um, good morning or good afternoon. My name is Mark Phillips. Um, I started out as an entrepreneur and had a few exits and a couple of failures along the way. I'm Australian from Sydney but lived in Palo Alto for about 14 years and together with my partner we run a, a micro fund and write checks of up to $500,000 in seed and then uh, we reload into Series A. And as an entrepreneur I, I struggled a lot with um, the content of what made a great investment pitch deck and a couple of years ago I decided to share about 20 uh, investment presentations in a book called Inside Silicon Valley and deconstruct the investment pitch deck and that's what I'm going to talk about today and give you some insights from um, what it takes to raise money, um, critique each slide in the investment pitch deck from both an entrepreneur's perspective and a venture capitalist perspective. And, um, Hopefully you'll enjoy it. Feel free to ask any questions and glad to have Sirk and um, Kerry on the phone with me as well. So I get asked this question a lot. What goes into an investment pitch deck? And they vary remarkably from an angel pitch deck, which is you know high level, tends to be more focused on the personality of the founders. And so you know, you've got a limited amount of time, maybe half an hour, at, at best an hour, with a, a micro or institutional venture capitalist. And I think the format's really important. And, um, you know, I'm quite strict on how I like to see decks. And it's not just because, um, you know, I like it this way. When you're presenting um, a, a, your investment pitch deck, firms often have other partners. They may not be present. And therefore, having um, a format that uh, ticks all the boxes, or most of them, is really important. So we're going to talk today about each of these slides, and all of them, all the examples I use are of uh, real companies that I've either invested in, been involved with, or um, you know, had, uh, had the privilege of hearing their pitch. So, slide one. Um, you know, first impressions really matter, um, and an elevator pitch is really important. So, think of slide one as an elevator pitch, and what I mean by that is you almost want to just as much tell uh, you want to show. And so, a logo, an image, a positioning line, or a mission statement is really important. Um, and I think you know, be, make most importantly, make an impression. Um, and so, I think uh, the next slide, Erica, will give a uh, another example of a you know, it. What does this slide do? It it creates emotion. It creates feeling. There's warmth. You'd be surprised how many slide decks we see or pitch decks we see that don't have a picture. Um, you know, picture paints a, a thousand words, and I think that's a, that. This is a, a good example of a of a. Um, you know exactly what this pitch deck is going to be, and it gets you a little bit excited. And I think part of telling the story when you're an entrepreneur to a venture capitalist is you know setting the scene, and this is what slide one 
should should do. Um, I always say slide two in the deck. If you don't know the investors, you want to present yourself. Um, you know, if it's over the phone and there's more of you on the telephone, it's good to show a face. It's good to show you know very briefly the experience and perhaps some of the um, the, the icons of logos of companies that your team has worked at before. And I think that's important because um, you, you're trying to build credibility at the same time, you know, show experience, uh, experience in the team. Um, now, if you're an early stage company, obviously you may not have a management team. Um, I do have a slide at the end of the deck that focuses on advisors as well. Um, but if you've got a an advisor that you're working really closely with at an early stage, you might want to put them up up here. But I think where we we like to get to very quickly is is the is slide number two, traditionally in the deck, which is the problem or the problem we solve. Um, I you know I think what you want to get to very quickly is not don't ramble about how you came up with the problem or how you decipher the problem uh, because we all know it's an iterative process. What you really want to do is say there's a big problem and we're here to solve it. Um, and this is a good example of a company that um, just talks about, wow, this massive $500 billion subscription economy um, you know, and 50 billion of it, 10% is a problem and they use good iconography, good colours of green and red um, to display what, what that problem is. Very easy to understand. If you don't mind, Mark, uh, we have a question back on that management slide. Before we move too far, can I just jump in with that? Sure. Sure. Okay. We have a question here from Nat who's wondering, if you're the only founder, do you still think you should have a management slide? How, how do you do that? It's a little difficult, um, so I think uh, I think not. I always encourage, you know, uh, sole entrepreneurs, of which I was one in my first company, to to build a small advisory team, um, and and you know, one of the ways you can do that is is um, work work with your attorneys or your accountants to to generate a, a stock option pool um, and and give some of those stock options out to advisors. I think it's good to show, you know, that you have a team that, uh, I, I, you know, a lot of the times we do get the entrepreneurs and they are single people, but just showing that you, someone else believes in your idea, that someone's supporting you, I think is critical. Um, so yeah, I think, I think going alone is, is it's a risk that there's no validation. Um, you know, Mark, if I could just add a, add a comment to that as well um, for Nat, and, 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 and I don't know, you know, what your company is and, and how far along you are, but you really should, I think even at an early stage, be thinking about adding to the team, be thinking about adding a co-founder um, possibly. If you are a technologist, you might, need, you, you might want to think about adding more of a spokesperson or a sales and marketing or a business development person. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is, well, the biggest one is that it just kind of takes the risk out of it, right, from an investor standpoint. If you think about investors and, and what they're thinking about, you know, you, we, we hear the term, um, you know, high risk, high reward. Um, in fact, that's not what the investors are looking for. They're looking for low risk, high return. Right? And everything that you do that adds to the risk profile makes it a little bit harder for them to say yes to you. And sole founders, there's more risk. There's more risk because you may just decide that you don't have the passion for it anymore and, and do something else. You may get an offer that's just too good to refuse and you may decide to skip it. Or you just may, or there, there's, just, there, there's just too many things that can go wrong with single individual founders. Um, plus, there's also the risk of, and there's been a lot of statistical evidence to, to back this up, that um, sole founders tend to um, pivot slower, meaning that you're going to go through pivots in your company, um, changes in direction, um, either product development or customer acquisitions. You're going to go through pivots. If you're a sole founder, you're kind of married to it. It's your baby, and you are more reluctant to make changes quicker. Um, and, and for those two main reasons, there's a little bit more risk. 
uh, for uh, investors when they look at sole founders. Thanks so much. I would just jump in. Terry, you might like to comment. Yes. Um, to add that you know, investors will want to see that you thought about your strengths and weaknesses as a founder. And I think having an idea of who you need to hire or advisors that are serving that role um, where you may have weaknesses in the interim is very, very important um, because you have to have a vision for the company and that um, is very, needs to be very clear in the beginning. Thank you guys. So, sorry to derail a little bit, yeah, but I, I think that's helpful. I mean, yeah. I think you've, often an entrepreneur, yeah, often, often your, Nat, your first trusted person in the company is the, um, your attorney who incorporates and, and you know, feel free, as I've done, uh, as a lot of our portfolio entrepreneurs have done, to lean on them um, and say, hey, can you introduce me to, you know, people that you know? Um, often the attorney sits on the, on the board or is, a, is an advisor, you know, has board observation rights. Um, and so, you know, work with your attorney um, to, to meet other people um, that can eventually become your advisor. So let's move on. Another way, if you've got a complicated problem, um, it's often good not to explain it, but to show. So there are instances in a pitch deck where the problem is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a multi-staged problem. And I think um, just to help people understand it uh, as well as you do, showing the problem visually um, through, as, as this uh, pitch deck does, uh, will just make your job and, uh, a lot easier and the, the VC or the investor will be able to digest the, the problem a lot quicker and easier than you rambling on about it for five minutes. So. And then another um, way to position the problem is just, um, you know, the sort of the before and the after, right? That's a technique that you might use. And the other side of it is just, you know, which is they've done. They've said, this is the current status quo and this is how we solve the problem. So before and after is a good way to, to explain the problem as well. And I think uh, as we move to the next slide, you know, very, I always think about a VC pitch from an entrepreneur's perspective between those first two slides of this is what we stand for, this is slide one, this is the problem, and here's our solution. That can be one or two minutes. It doesn't have to be a long time because really what all investors want to see is that shiny new thing, right? What have you got that they haven't seen before? Um, and you don't want to take too long in the sort of your story to show them, right? It's like the movie you watch that when are they going to get to the exciting part? So the solution slide often is a great way to segue into a live demo or to pull out, you know, the tablet or mobile device to show the application. But I think it's really important to have a still image of what you've built to show, because remember when this deck leaves that interactive presentation you're giving face to face or over the phone, your, the, the, the venture capitalist or investor most likely will send it to someone else um, within their firm for comment. And so being able to sort of have the solution um, in, a, in an image or a picture uh, format is important. Um, but I think, you know, having and showing a demo uh, whether it's alpha or whether it's a you know it's a live working model is really important. Um, this look this solution slide you know it talks a little bit about when it's a complicated uh, solution or it's got various parts to moving parts. You've got to break it down, and I think you know breaking it down um, pictorially with images. Uh, helps people understand. Not everyone can digest, you know, what you're saying, right? People like to learn in different ways and images um, are often easier for a lot of people to digest.
So I think um, the slide five is more about, um, and we won't get to it yet, Erica, but slide five is more about how your solution works. I think it's really important just um, theatrically when you're pitching your, uh, your investment deck is to say, here's the problem, here's the solution, show it, get people really interested. You can start to hear their, their mind grind about, wow, how does this work? But one of the things I always say to entrepreneurs is at that point in time, you want to sort of further the excitement or validate the market and say, this is how big the market is for this product or service. And this is not the prettiest of slides, but it demonstrates sort of how to build a market size. As a venture capitalist, we want to see that you've thought about how big the market is. Um, you want to put a number on it, you want to put a, a dollar value on it. And so if you haven't, you, you often have to go and get third party sources or statistics to validate and verify how big the market is. So the next slide talks, there's, there's th three market sizes. The first market size is the total market size. I used this example yesterday speaking to an entrepreneur. Look, everyone that drives a motor car around the world you know, could potentially buy a Tesla. But their service, that's the total market opportunity. But the serviceable market is where they're actually selling the product or the car in North America, in China, and some other parts of the world. And then what you really want to do is, to, if it's appropriate, is to talk about the initial market size, which is, hey, we're only going after selling Teslas to you know, ardent people in the tech sector in the Bay Area, because that's where our manufacturing plant is in Fremont, and you know we, we just want to sell to a small group of folks. And so I think you want to not just try and tell the, the VC or the investor you're going to hit it out of the park and you're going to make billions of dollars tomorrow. It's more about, okay, we have a total market, we have a serviceable market in the short, medium term, and in the, in the, um, we have an initial market, which is how we're going to get to market. And I often triangulate this slide and the understanding the entrepreneur has about how they're going to get their product to that market with the go-to-market slide later in the deck. Um, and it also just shows that as an entrepreneur that you've got a sort of a, an understanding of the market size and how, how big it is, but also you're realistic enough to understand that, you know, with the one or two or three million dollars that you're raising in this particular round, how you're going to um, execute on that market opportunity. Mark, if I could just add to that, and, and I think that's a really, really great last point. I think all of the points are, are spot on, but you know, this is an opportunity for the entrepreneur to be able to um, combine right the initial market that you're going after with the resources that you're going to need, right, in order to achieve it, right. So you're not going to be hiring a huge full-time team to try to go after this SAM, the serviceable available market. Instead, you're going to be going after an initial or serviceable obtainable market initially and, and, and understanding the requirements, the resources you're going to need, how much money you're trying to raise and what you're going to be able to um, hire, who you're going to be able to hire and what resources you're going to be able to bring to bear on the solution that you're trying to achieve um, is going to give uh, the investor a lot of confidence about you understanding the market, you understanding the company, you understanding what needs to happen for you to be successful. So we have a, another question from the audience here. Um, sorry, we're having a little time delay and some, some sound problems, but hopefully everyone can hear us okay. And um, we have a question here. Someone's asking, when coming up with the initial market size, what's the best approach to estimate that rather than just guess? So how can you make a good estimate on your initial market size? Look, I think secondary, you know, desktop research, you know, whether that's a a third-party syndicated research study, um, or you know, a, a notable masthead, whether it's uh, you know Wall Street Journal or an industry trade journal, I think is important. Um, what the investor VC is looking for here is that your you know you, it's a chance for you to shine and show your intelligence to work out that you as the entrepreneur can you know, quantify the opportunity. So yeah, you do need to 
however difficult it is, and uh, you, you need to be able to provide some validation of it through third party sources. Yeah, I, it's this is a, this is a, a, a such an open ended question because it is so dependent on the actual product or service that you are developing. Um, because uh, just every every single different solution um, is going to have a different answer in terms of where you go for data, um, where you go for hard data, where you go for soft data. You know, I, I really I really push. I really push entrepreneurs to, um, to, to test out the market. If you're talking with uh, VCs, um, you know, hopefully you're at a stage where you've already got a prototype or you've already got a working product or a beta and you're able to actually market it to people and you can see the kind of responses that you're getting and, and, and hopefully there's some metrics and some data um, behind some campaigns that you've already run, um, some, some, some uh, um, you know, ad, uh, word, word searches. Um, keyword searches. Um, just there's going to be different things that you do, and there's really no specific one answer that will um, apply across the board. So slide three was all about your solution. Slide five is about how it works, right? Um, and what the architecture is. And I think you know, diagrammatically is a good way to to show it. Um, you know, there are servers, there is middleware, there is, um, you know, hardware components and, you know, how the whole ecosystem fits together, your technology ecosystem. So, you know, if you do have, uh, you want to really show what's under the hood and maybe the next slide as well, Erica. Um, you know, you want to give some sense of how it works in slide five. And I like this example because it shows the sort of, um, proprietary engine underneath the dashboard. So you're showing a, 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 a complementary thought process of this is what you see on the screen and this is what's under the hood. This is the APIs, this is the algorithms, this is the, um, the, the databases, this is how the, the data is retrieved um, and, and how the information engine works. So I just like to, to point out that you want to give some sense that you, you know that the VC an overview of the technology architecture. It's at this point in the pitch that you might want to segue with your CTO or co-founder, the technical person, and let them talk about it. Right? What you're trying to do is you know evidence to the investors that you've got a team and you are a team, and balance up your investment pitch by giving yourself a breather as well as you know supplementing your your story with the right person and the because you know, we want to I personally always like to know that you know that, that there is deep domain expertise um, there's some because that becomes part of the technology advantage and the defensibility which we'll talk about on the next slide um, uh, just to jump in Joseph is wondering is if you have a demo is this the appropriate place where it would go Joseph, I think back on slide three is the appropriate segue at the solution. Um, I've been involved in a lot of pitches where uh, you get drawn into a sort of a 10 minute, this is how cool our tech is at this point in the pitch. And you know that's what due diligence is for. That's what the follow up call is for, where uh, you know we always send uh, entrepreneurs that are pitching us, if we like their tech, we send it to one of the portfolio companies that we've got and, and they can often you know, use the, the um, tech in a trial or we can speak to one of our trusted portfolio company executives about the technology. Um, you know, often as VCs, we're not the best person to do a deep dive into the tech. So I, I think in the initial pitch, no. Um, maybe the second and third meeting, definitely, with, with various partners. Um, you want to make that invitation available and say, look, I'd love to go into this in more detail, but I just want to give you sort of a, you know, an inch deep, a mile wide, and if you want to get deep on another call, love to. And that's, that's kind of setting up, you know, in a sales sense, setting up the next call um, and inviting the investor to take another call with you. Um, here's a great slide. These guys raised a bunch of money. Um, very simple. 
Um, but it just shows how it works again, um, you know, because people like to see the user's perspective. How do I, you know, how do I engage with it? What's the onboarding? How do I install it? Um, so it's really talking about the product architecture at a uh, technology level, but also from a user perspective, how they onboard or engage and, and interact with that's important as well. Um, and I'd love Kerry to sort of dive into this slide as well because obviously what VCs are investing in is something that is unique and um, is defensible uh, or highly scalable that can grow really fast. And so you need to, on slide six, talk about we are the only team in the world that understands you know, this uh, cyber cryptography or intelligence or some deep tech or, and then you might say we've launched patents um, and then Kerry, I'd love you to sort of dive in on this as well to talk about you know, how, how entrepreneurs with tech should go about protecting their IP because it's certainly something we, we look for. Right. Thanks, Mark. So, yes, we typically refer to this as kind of the unique competitive advantage slide. And here you really are looking for an aspect of your business that makes you um, the best in class and difficult to replicate easily. Um, so a lot of the times our founders will come in and if they do have a piece of technology that is unique and novel um, that they are planning to use to scale their business, we'll have them file uh, typically provisional patent applications. So provisional patent is certainly a, a good kind of first step to protect some of your ideas. Um, in addition, there might be a trademark aspect to it or a trade secret aspect to it. But if you talk to a good intellectual property attorney, they should be able to map out a strategy for you where they look at the core components of your business and tell you what might be protectable and what, what isn't protectable. Um, and, you know, again, you want to make sure that you are putting up some, you know, early barriers to entry. Um, and in addition, making sure that, you know, you are, you're talking to someone who has the ability to file patents and trademarks and the like. I was in a meeting the other day, Kerry, and uh, the guys said to me, oh, we're not filing patents yet because we don't want our competitors to know what we're doing. What, how do you advise startup entrepreneurs on, on that question or the issues around it? So that's an interesting point. I mean, there, I would say there is rarely a technology that is um, completely new and novel. And what I would say, one of the advantages of filing a provisional patent is that if you, it gives you an earlier time stamp um, as an entrant into the market. So, you know, if you think there are a lot of competitors out there, yes, there's an opportunity for someone to see what your patent application discloses, but on the other hand, if you do file something, it gives you an earlier date of protection, so you can potentially be offensive um, with competitors and not um, not on the defense. So I would, you know, I would recommend to entrepreneurs and founders that they really um, do their research on what else is out there, um, and then make an informed decision based on what else is publicly available. Because more often than not, there will be something publicly available that's similar to what you're doing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so look, just on you know, defensibility and scalability for entrepreneurs are key terms in the pitch deck. You've got to convince the VC that you know, this product's going to grow in a non-linear way. Um, you know, it's not just about adding more money and adding the sales folks. It's about where's the that hockey stick come in, um, and often that where's the value created. You know, I guess we think about Google and we think, wow, you know, they were a quicker, faster search engine, but you know, they had a lot of they had an underlying um, 
technology that was def, you know was patented. Priceline is a great example. Um, you know, Priceline with that reverse option, the re blind reverse option, they have a uh, a process pattern that no one can copy. So I think it's really important to to explain that at this section of the, the pitch deck. Next. I always like to segue here a little bit and sort of back up and say, okay, what are some of the pitch tips that I recommend? Um, you know, the first one I always say is when you're selecting investors, always select those that, as a preference that can re-up on their investment, right? Because we always, as a lot of investors venture guys do, look at which of the existing investors are reinvesting. There's no greater vote of confidence in you, your team, and your technology um, than a committed re reinvestment from from one or more um, <coughs> insiders. I think in presentations, um, fortunately, I've had a lot of media training over the years. Um, Short sentences and non-technical speak. Um, don't try and wow the investor with all these different acronyms and um, technology. That you know, break it down. Keep it in a very layperson's approach um, and make it simple for everyone to understand. We don't know everything. Um, and I think when you're in a face-to-face -face situation, body language. Um, definitely keep eye contact with with entrepreneur with the entrepreneur with the venture capital or the investor, you're trying to build trust. And if you read any of the body language books, um, it's all about you know engaging that person and eye contact is important. And as I mentioned before, you know, keep the presentation balanced, defer to your other co-founders um, you know, or your CTO. Uh, keep some consistent momentum and pace. Um, I always sort of think if you've got half an hour and you've got you know, 10 or 12 slides, give it a minute and a half each, which will give you, say, 20 minutes with 10 minutes of questions. But yeah, keep the pace in a presentation. Don't get hung up on one particular slide. Even though the VC might want to dive in and ask you questions, I always say keep moving with the pace and you can always circle back around if there are um, more in-depth questions. And be prepared for conflict. Um, you know, VCs will often challenge you. You might not have your A game on that day. Um, you may have lost a client. You may have come out of a bad pitch or a great pitch. Um, so you're be, just be, you know, aware that you are human and um, be in control of your emotions. Um, and when I say be aware of your emotional timeline, um, you know, just just remember that uh, you, you know, we are human and you do have different emotions and the VC might try and throw a curveball at you and um, test your metal, test your resolve. Um, often we come from industries or have exited companies, and we know we know a lot more than you know the entrepreneur. So just be aware of that, um, and it's a like great opportunity if you don't know something, not to try and prove that you do know everything. Um, and ask for help and say that's exactly why I'm talking to you, Mr. VC or or, or Miss Investor, because uh, I do need this help. Um, I always try and connect with analogies and anecdotes. Um, I think just you know real life scenarios or real examples of of different products and how they work and how your product might be similar but slightly different just makes it real for people. Um, and you know, I have best piece of advice I ever heard was, you know, team, market size and product. Reiterate that through your presentation. Um, we've got a great team. It's a huge market. It's a massive opportunity. Our products got fit. We have customers. Um, and I think, you know, sort of coming back to these central um, pillars in your presentation of the team, the market size and the product fit is really important. Because a lot of VCs will actually think, if I could get two of the three uh, and everything else is fixable or achievable in the future, I'll, I'll, I'll back the company, I'll invest. 
and I've done this myself where the market fit um, or the product fit and the team has been great, the market size we're not sure and we've made investments. So a couple of pitch tips, I um, thought I'd just throw them in and um, next slide. Uh, the and forward, uh, yep. Sir can uh, feel free to jump in if you've got any other tips, I know you sit in on a lot of pitches too. Sure, I, I would just encourage um, entrepreneurs to practice as much as possible um, because you need to know it inside and out and the more you practice, the more comfortable with the pitch you'll be. Good point. <laughs> Um, before we move on, we, we have a, a number of questions here about um, s around selecting the right VC to pitch to, and I, I'm just going to package these all together because I think they're kind of related questions. Um, first of all, it, it, the, people are wondering if VCs will invest in more than one company within an area. So, you know, and if they do, if, if you know, is, is it safe to ask a VC if they've recently invested in, say, a competitor, and if they have is it just not worth your time? Are they not going to bother investing in you if they have invested in your company? And as a side note to that, related back to that IP issue, it seems some, some people are concerned, you know, would you ever have a VC sign an NDA? Is there any risk of sharing your idea with a VC if they're investing in competitors? So I, that's a lot I just threw at you, but I think they go together. <laughs> yeah, maybe Kerry, you could lead off and I'll, I'll come here after. Sure. So we... Um you know, in my experience, I do find that there, there are two ways to look at it. There are some VCs who like to um, have portfolio companies that are complementary and not necessarily competitive. So if you take ad tech, for example, there are a lot of VC firms that to invest in ad tech as a vertical. So they might have companies in their portfolios that are semi-overlapping. So in that case, I would say it's kind of safe to pitch that VC. Um, there are other VCs, on the other hand, that um, right off the bat will say, you know, we're not going to take a look at this because it's competitive to one of our companies. I find that the latter instance is more, I, I see that more often. So I see more VCs saying we're not going to invest in this because it is competitive with something that we're doing. Um, what I would be wary of or just have you know in mind is that this is worst case scenario, but it's a lawyer's job to point out the, the worst case scenario, is um, there are some VCs who might want to learn a lot about your company um, in order to kind of get market intelligence and diligence on what's going on in the field. Now, I don't think there are really instances it would be egregious if there were of VCs taking um, information and then, you know, directing a portfolio company to do something very specific that you've showed them in a pitch setting, um, but it is something to be mindful of. Um, that said, to the final point about signing an NDA, we also don't see um, we don't see a lot of prevalence of NDAs in an initial meeting. Um, it's kind of looked upon as the person can, is not trusting the VC and can set up their relationship, I think, in the wrong tone. So Mark, I'd love that, your perspective on that as well. Well, well let, me, let me just add one, one comment, too. Um, and that is actually, this is part of you know, your job as an entrepreneur is to uh, do a little bit of research right into the companies that you're going to be pitching to um, and target those VCs who are good fits. You know, maybe they, are, they do play in your space. You could take a look at the portfolio companies that they've invested in. And if you can make a pitch um, that what you are offering to them is complementary to other investments that they've made, and as a whole, um, you could become a part of that, that whole um, that makes it a better uh, portfolio of companies uh, that they've invested in, I think you've gone a long ways 
um, towards, again, gaining trust, um, gaining confidence from VCs that you understand, you know, not only from an entrepreneur standpoint, but from a VC standpoint, you know, the risk profile that, 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 that they want to be in, in, in and how you can actually address um, their needs and, and how you could be a benefit, you know, beyond just the actual investment that they're making in your company. Um, if, you can, if you can, you know, provide more value than that by being able to show how you might be complementary to their other portfolio companies, that's a pretty powerful um, tool. I would, I would agree. Yeah, I I've, seen, that, I've yeah. seen, yeah, I've seen both sides. I've seen VCs, you know, just take meetings to get market intelligence for one of their portfolio companies or upcoming investments and um, you've just got to be, you know, buyer beware and, um, you know, the other side is that, yeah, to Cirque's point, do your homework, you know. Most of us have extensive LinkedIn's and bios and tweeters, and you can find a lot about out about us, um, and 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 you know work out whether or not we do have investments in competitors, um, at companies, and if you know, just save yourself uh, the time and potential worry about it. But moving on to slide seven, um, I think it's really important to now talk to your, uh, the investors about how you're going to distribute the product, how you're going to go to market, um, you know, are you going to go direct, are you going to go through, uh, uh, you know, resellers, uh, are you going to, you know, sell this product uh, through stores um, or distributors. So I think it's really important. So the go to market and what I try and do is triangulate the market size slide to this slide to the financial projections. I want to know that the entrepreneur has thought about, um, hey, am I going to have a, an inside sales team or am I just going to you know, um, go direct online and put a lot of money into the marketing uh, as opposed to you know, headcount? And so this is an opportunity to talk to about how you're going to get to market. And slide eight, I've got a couple of examples here. It's really just, yeah, it's, it's nothing that you probably haven't seen before, but it's a competitor matrix. Now, you may, you may not have any competitors, um, and they're the competitors that you don't know. Uh, probably 90% of the time, I'm telling entrepreneurs that they have competitors. Um, I think you should put some competitive matrix up. It validates the industry. It shows that your product or service is um, at a, at, on a feature level and a functional level, you've got pros and cons. We don't expect you to have a, you know, a, the world's best product. That's why you're raising money to build version two, three, four, and the team that goes along with it. So, visually, this is a good example. The next slide as well, Erica, um, shows a competitive matrix. Um, again, pretty simple, but you'll see they use. This is Unami. They use an example of, hey, we've got more users, we've got more data, we've got, you know, a, a freemium model. So it's very clear that they've done their homework, and you can talk intelligently about the market generally as well. And the next slide is another example um, where you want to be in the right quadrant. This for for Punch Card um, down in Pasadena. They took a sort of a, you know quadrant approach where they said we are the only company in that um, you know, fast growth uh, right hand side uh, quadrant. So I like showing a couple of different examples. It just shows that you're considered. VCs like to see it because they think, oh, I know someone at um, you know at a competitor, I'll give them a call, or this is interesting because um, it, it 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 gives uh, data points that you want to express uh, across to the VC. So moving along to the next slide, um, to the revenue projections, slide nine. A um, couple of different ways to, to present it. I always like to see something fairly compact. I don't think you need to have, and sir, feel free to chime in what you, you suggest to your 400 um, startup clients, but I like to see a couple of things in the financials, um, and that is down the bottom. You'll see. I like to see the EBITDA. I like to see the burn. How much cash you're going to burn on an annualised basis. So really, that's we want to 
invest enough or you want to raise enough to cover that. And then the headcount. Um, so you can do a little bit of mathematics around, oh, you know, in year one they've got seven staff and they're turning over six hundred thousand dollars, that's you know, per employee, um, you know, uh seventy thousand uh, eighty, ninety thousand dollars per per uh, employee. So there's just a couple of ways that you can present the revenue projections. Sir, what what do you find most startups uh, do yeah. really well? I, I think um, I, I think that's a great point, Mark. I think that that is the information that investors want to see. I'm not even sure that I would actually even go to the point of of, of bringing it up in a in a pitch deck. I think um, you know the the slide a couple uh, down later. That's more of a chart. So I'm not a big fan of putting up spreadsheets um, in um, in a in a presentation like this. Obviously, we need to have the spreadsheets. We need to know, know the numbers cold, right? The entrepreneurs need to know the numbers absolutely cold. But actually, go go to the next one, um, um, Erica. And this is the this is the slide that I think I I, I like the best, um, which is just a chart that shows okay, where's the revenue going to come from? Especially if it's coming coming from multiple sources, where is the revenue coming from? How big is it growing over time? And then you know whether you know you want to look at operating profit or maybe you want to look at EBITDA or or some other metric that shows okay, how much cash am I using and how much cash am I going to be generating over that over that period of time. I think this is really, really powerful and, and actually sp speaks to, and again, to Mark's point about triangulating this, um, this kind of data with the, um, uh, with the uh, go-to-market uh, strategies and the amount of money that you're trying to raise is really, really key. Um, you know, spreadsheets, I've seen it both. I, I think it can be uh, powerful. There's a lot of information that's contained there. Um, but I've also seen some investors, and, and maybe they're just not as interested at that point in time. But I've seen them kind of, you know, start getting a little bit um, glassy-eyed when they see too many numbers on, on, on a slide like that. I would rather see a chart. In, in, in almost all cases, I'd rather see charts and graphics than words and numbers. And we have a question. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Going back one slide, Erica. Um, sure. You know, you have. Oh, sure. That's okay. You can you can go, and then I'll jump in. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, just the unit economics are important. Um, we have an investment in a company, and I'm always asking them about the unit economics, and and what that really means is, you know, what's the cost of of production versus the cost of selling it, um, and so. You take a lot of the Kickstarter or Indiegogo campaigns. Um, you know, you've hardware is, is a bit of a renaissance in in th that industry, and therefore you just really want to know um, and show what the gross margins will be, what the cost of manufacturing or production with delivery is going to be as well. So if you've got an e-commerce uh, type company where you're selling online, you've got to talk to the unit economics. You've got to make the investor feel that you understand that you're Costs maybe today are greater than your revenue, but over time your revenue will will, uh, will outpace the cost, and there'll be margin and profit in there. So I just don't get uh, if 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 you're not sure of your projections, you know, a good way to talk to investors is about the the unit economics. And we have a question here from Michael that, that's kind of specific, but I bet there are people listening in who, who may have related questions. So he, he's asking, for a team building a product where the main goal is user enjoyment and growth, how would you convey the monetary value, value early on with, without a classic revenue model? Yeah, good question. I mean, performance... Uh, indicators are, you know, whether it's traffic to your website, whether it's number of downloads, whether it's trials signed up for, often it's the you know, reduction in churn. Um, and I think you, you want to set uh, performance metrics with uh, investors and, and if it's early on in your company, say to them, I will keep you informed. I have spreadsheets actually I send to entrepreneurs and say, I like what you're doing, fill this in keep me posted and um, you know whether that's cost per install, revenue per customer, you decide what they are, put them down and say we've got limited data at the moment but I will keep you posted. Um, it's not a strong suit because we are where we are in our, in our uh, uh, cycle um, 
so yeah, that hopefully that that helps. Um, and here's a great example of a company I know pretty well, um, and we actually decided not to invest in this company, but I thought the investment presentation was brilliant because it did have a lot of those metrics. Um, and and so here's just a good example of you know not talking to financials but talking to metrics as as much as the revenue. I spoke about this slide earlier, which is you know your advisors um, again the validation the verification your idea um, you know your your attorney can introduce you to various people um, but yeah building a uh, an advisory panel is important. I did when I first uh, came came to America, and I thought it was fantastic. I, you know, choose someone in tech, choose choose someone who you're happy to go and have a beer with, choose someone that can you know help you do marketing and public relations, choose uh, someone from other industries that are uh, uh, you know have similar business models. Um, so yeah, having advisors. Uh, is a good is a good idea, and then moving on to the second last slide, which is the use of funds, which is um, you know you are asking for money, and we like to most of the time know how much you're asking for, at what price, um, and 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 maybe Kerry can talk to whether it's a good idea to lead with evaluation or discuss the valuation or just you know the paperwork associated with it. Uh, I know we like as venture capitalists to know that there's an attorney um, as the as the point person that can handle all the paperwork. So, um, right, sure. So I can I can jump in there. Um, typically, it will depend on um, it will depend on how early you are. Um, if you've raised money before from angel groups. Um, or whatnot, we typically don't see a lot of companies putting evaluation in their presentation. And the reason is is that when you're very early and you're having your first meetings with VCs, um, what we've found just based on experience is that the VCs will often set the terms. Um, so if it's very early stage, it's really going to be a collaborative process. And there's all sorts of data actually that we have online um, in our Cooley Go website that will show you kind of median valuation for each stage. So your valuation is going to be in a certain range um, if you're very early on. And so it's kind of understood that the VCs or the angel group will want a certain percentage of your company and that you'll, your valuation could be anywhere you know, from call it one to five when you're first starting out. Um, so again, based on experience, a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs don't lead with evaluation but are then looking to the VCs to kind of give them an early signal about how much it might be. Um, in terms of term sheets, um, we do recommend that you have kind of a term sheet drafted. You should work with your attorney to learn what's in a term sheet, learn the different provisions, and have that drafted when you go into investor meetings as a potential leave behind. So again, it's important to know in the beginning what the various terms are um, and kind of do a little market research and then have a document that could be used if, if necessary. I'll, I'll add a couple of final points to this as well. Um, you know, it, it's it's outside of the scope of this uh, presentation, but obviously you want to understand the differences between an equity round of financing versus a convertible debt round of financing. Um, you know, there's there's you know pros and cons of both. Um, you know, different times and 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 approaches for both. Um, the, the the final point that I want to make, um, and so you should understand that. But the final point that I want to make is about how much you're looking to raise. Um, you should know what that amount is. You, we could 
talk about the terms later, but you should know what that amount is, and it should be based upon milestones. We are really, really, really big proponents of, of milestone financing because the valuation of your company is not linear, it's not a curve. Hopefully, it's going to take step function increases in valuation, and those step function increases in valuation are going to happen when you hit major milestones. And so the, the point of every financing, every round of financing, is to get you enough money, get you enough resources to hit that next set of milestones such that your valuation of the company increases, um, and, and when you do the next round of financing, you're able to do it at a stepped-up valuation and give up less, less of your company. Some investors don't um, mind if the exit strategy or the exit slide is not included in the deck. Personally, I like to see it because it helps me understand I mean, some of these potential exit, uh, uh, exit plays could be channel partners as well. Um, so you know, it, there's two schools of thought. School one is, hey, it's too early, don't focus on exit. Uh, school two is, and I know entrepreneurs have told me they're going to sell their company to you know, PayPal or Adobe and they've gone ahead and done it. So um, it's, it's not a critical part of the pitch deck, it's an optional slide. Um, it can aid conversation and help with business development or channel partnerships um, as well as it might just you know, focus the investor on, oh wow, yeah, I, I, I think Cisco would be an excellent and it helps them get excited as well. So that, that takes us to the end here, and we're pushed up against the clock, but I had one final question that I kind of thought would be a nice way to wrap it up. Um, we had a question in regards to what Kerry said earlier about practice, practice, practice in terms of your pitch. So maybe if we could just go around the horn with Kerry, then Cirque, then Mark, with your kind of 20-second answer of how do you suggest practicing? What's the best way to get this down? Uh, I'll, I'll start and just say um, it just, every single time you do it, it's going to feel more comfortable. Um, record yourself, um, practice to anyone and everyone, and, and practice not only just to your, your family and friends because obviously they're going to be supportive and you want that, but you should also try to practice to you know, people who, um, who might be a little bit more critical, who might give you more con constructive criticism. Um, but I just say any single time you can do it, practice to your, 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 your spouse, your kids, uh, you know, to your aunt and uncle, practice to your dog. Every single time that you do it, you will get better. Um, and, and by the time you actually get in front of investors, you should have this thing honed down. You should not be practicing um, in front of investors. Right. And I would add as well, you can use your advisors for this. Um, that includes anyone who's serving as a formal advisor and also an attorney, an accountant. Um, if you know other entrepreneurs, um, you know, batting things off of them is a really good idea as well. So really look to your network to see who might be able um, to give you some critical feedback and then try to do that as frequently as possible. I don't have anything to add. I just feel let your personality come through as well. Um, that's, and I think that that's really important. Don't try and be robotic or scripted. Um, you know, have some, let your personality come through and be natural. Yeah, you can't be reading the slides, you know, it should be conversational, you should be explaining things, but, um, you know, the best, con the best presentations are going to be ones where there's a little bit of a dialogue, right, between you and your team, between investors and you, um, and, 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 you know, d developing that rapport um, is, is probably just as critical as actually ex explaining the information on the slides. Well, it's probably even more important than that. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much. I'm sorry we went a couple minutes over here, just had, had a lot to talk about. <laughs> um, you can all see the contact information here, so if you do have further questions, feel free to reach out to any of our panelists with your follow-up questions. We had a few outstanding questions, too. We'll follow up with you guys individually through emails to make sure those questions are answered. Uh, I'm loath to keep you any longer, so I won't tell you about our upcoming events, but check out our events page and you can see. And on that note, I just want to thank uh, Mark and Carrie and Cirque so much for this wonderful presentation, and thanks to everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thank, Thanks, you, Thank you.